Today on the Perception in Action podcast, a discussion about how film and video can be used to identify information movement control laws and affordances and be used to guide an athlete's exploration of perceptual motor space. So it's time for a call to action. Hello, and thanks for joining me. This is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25-year journey as a researcher, professor, and high-performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. If you're a coach or an instructor, my goal is to help you bridge the gap between research and application, and to connect your experiential knowledge with skill acquisition and motor learning theory. I want to help take you from using practice design recipes to becoming a master chef who can manipulate the key ingredients to come up with your own innovative training methods. If you're a student or fellow academic working in the skill acquisition field, I hope to keep you up to date on the latest studies and help you get to know the people working in this area. Finally, if you're developing training technologies, I hope to help you incorporate good motor learning principles in your design, pull out key performance metrics from the data, and design effective studies to evaluate your product. To learn more, help support the podcast, and or work directly with me, please check out perceptionaction.com. Now on to the show. Okay, welcome everyone to another edition of the Perception in Action Journal Club. Uh, This one uh, we'll get to in a bit. We're going to talk about an ecological approach to using kind of film and video uh, for coaching and and performance. Uh, So we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, I'll, I'll mention this later on for people following along. If you have any comments, whatever you're listening on, you can post them and we'll see them and I'll pose them to the group um, as we go along and or questions. Okay. So I thought I would start. We have some returning guests and some a couple, uh, a couple of new people, I think. So I'll st- I wanted to let everybody uh, introduce themselves and then before we get into the topic. So I'll go start with my uh, right. We'll go Casey. Yeah, thanks for having me, Rob. My name is Casey Kreider, uh, assistant volleyball coach at University of Miami down in South Florida, and uh, mostly a longtime fanboy of the podcast and <laughs> tricked my way into to be on the show. So thanks for having me, and I'll try not to screw too much up here. Oh, no, always a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, Tyler. That's fantastic to follow, Casey. I love that. <laughs> uh, I, I probably fall into the same boat as well. Um, been on recently, actually. So thanks for having me back, Rob. Tyler Yerby, Director of Education at Emergence and a doctoral student with Keith Davids and Will Roberts at the University of Gloucestershire. And uh, returning, haven't seen her in a while, Marianne, the adventurer, equestrian, uh, and all the other things, sport. Hi, Marianne. Hi. Hi, uh, Marianne Davies. Um, oh, so I'm with UK Coaching as a senior coach developer, and I'm doing a PhD with at uh, Sheffield Hallam with Joe Stone and Keith Davids, and and I've also always been a massive fan, so it's always a pleasure to be invited back. <laughs> Um, you don't all have to say that, you know. <laughs> you all get your check in the mail, even. <laughs> uh, Sean, good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you as well, my friend. I'm not waiting for a check. I'm now waiting for my member's jacket, which oh, is still totally. probably stuck in the mail. <laughs> uh, m- maybe FedEx is just a little delayed or something of that nature. But uh, uh, my name is Sean Mishka. Um, I'm a co-director of education alongside Tyler at Emergence, uh, as well as working with NFL players. Uh, and I have been doing that for 12, now going on 13 years uh, as a movement skill acquisition coach. Uh, So people probably have heard me speak here before. Um, And maybe, Rob, when they say that they're a fan of the podcast, uh, maybe I get a few points there as well. Uh So uh, (laughs) um, with how many appearances that I now have forced my way into uh, or been channeled into. So thanks again for having me. This is a discussion that I'm obviously very excited and invigorated by. And then James, how are you doing? Well, I think you're muted, James. That is such a classic, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you got it. Someone's got to do it. Right? Yeah. What a rookie, hey? I don't get any jackets. It's my second time on the pod. Can't even unmute. Um, no, but um, I'm working in, in Sweden at AIK Football Club. Um uh, head of development for 13 to 19 there, so working with uh, some some good people, and we're really trying to implement um, ecological approaches to player development. 
uh, as much as possible from the way we organize the club right down to the pedagogy that happens on the pitch and everything in between. So uh, today's discuss discussion <laughs> is another piece uh, of the puzzle. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. Great. Yeah. Thank you for staying up late for us. <laughs> I realize it's, uh, and last but not least, new uh, uh, Maurice. Yeah. Good evening, everyone from Barcelona. Uh, I'm Mauricio Lopez, uh, the CEO of Cognia, uh, but I'm a former student from the Center for the Ecological Study of Perception and Action at Yukon uh, with uh, legends from the field like Michael Turby, Bob Shaw, Carello, uh, Claire Michaels, and <laughs> you name it. So it's a pleasure to be here, to be honest. Uh, I didn't know about uh, this podcast and James uh, Vaughan, um, told me about it and and I'm so happy to be here and uh, ready to enjoy the night. Yes, it, yeah, it's great to have you and uh, I think I was reading your, one of your papers a couple of <laughs> a few months ago. Uh, so it's really great to have you. Yeah, so as I mentioned the the topic we wanted to cover on I think you know the reason we came up with this is a, a few of us were saying that you, know, you had people asking about this and I think it's a natural kind of question to have is how do you use film, video, whatever you want to call it, uh, from ecological approach? Um, the uh, kind of, you know, if you think about it, those things are usually typically used in a very prescriptive way, right? You watch someone's film and you put, look at what they're doing wrong, either on a team level in terms of tactics or on an individual level in terms of technique, and you use it to correct. And so what we wanted to do is talk about I think some different ideas of, of ways to use it uh, and uh, it's, it's going to be kind of an open discussion. As I told the guys before we started, I don't have any idea where this will go. As we say, it will emerge is as we say. So, so I thought I would start off with, I started off with a Sean because Sean, I, I was reading today, you wrote a blog post on this topic, right? On the eye in the sky never lies as long as you know what to look for. So, Maybe, Sean, can I ask you to set the stage for us, kind of the, the the background? I did it briefly, but you really got into it nicely in your, your article. Well, thank you, Rob. And I, I certainly appreciate uh, kind of picking up where you left off there. Like I said, this is a topic that obviously is really near and dear to my heart because it serves as the crux of pretty much all the work that I do. Uh, I expand in that article, for those of you who haven't seen it, um, around my process of using film, specifically in context, in situ uh, scenarios and situations to really dive into the problem solving capabilities of NFL players. Now I do that before the players ever even get to me. And when I say that before they ever even get to me, I mean, before I elect to really even work with a player, I try to determine why as well as how uh, they might have gotten to that place from a skill acquisition and then obviously problem solving standpoint and perspective. So uh, I have gotten to the point where I probably overdo it with the film. If I'm going to be quite honest, Tyler uh, probably can attest to that at this time of the year, specifically for my players, the players that I partner and work with, I I'm looking at film probably 30 to 40 hours per week, depending on exactly how many players I have and how much playing time they got, of course, because even with 10 to 12 NFL players, uh, you're going to see a wide variety of not only uh, situations and conditions, but obviously personal constraints that are going to come into the play as well. Um, but I have used that film to really lean on me being able to put myself in the human movement system of that player to try and determine how they are currently solving the movement problems that are being presented to them what affordances they might be perceiving, what affordances they are selecting, and ultimately how they are acting upon those affordances, that then I can then use that analysis and sort of my understanding from my perspective uh, as to what gaps they may need to fill, what weaknesses they have within their movement skill set that I can then look to use to inform my practice design. So I can then set problems that stretch them in, in ways that whether it's perceptually, cognitively, or from a motor and action degrees of freedom standpoint to gain abundance and ultimately, hopefully gain adaptability and then dexterity. So I think this is a topic that not only needs to be discussed a whole heck of a lot more, but I'm just really excited to hear of others who are doing it and how, what their process looks like as well. 
Yeah, one of the things I really liked about your article, Sean, I, I think this is a general issue I have with a lot of coaching is we spend too much time thinking about where we want to go without spending time to understand where the athlete is now, right? The One of the keys, like if you want to use a constraints-led approach, you need to understand their current movement solution so you can destabilize it, right? If you rush off <laughs> without understanding what their information they're using, what affordances they're picking up, I don't think you can be as effective as a coach without understanding that. And we kind of skip that part because we want to get to the good stuff, I think, a lot of times. Does anyone else want to jump in kind of thoughts on, you know, that or, you know, using video the traditional way they're using or, or any ideas like that? I'll leave it open. Yeah, Rob, I'll go ahead and jump in here. Sure. Yeah, I'll jump in here. One thing that I left out in our introduction simply because there's a lot of us on the call here and want to give everybody room is I work with athletes almost year round as well. It, it's it's actually reduced a little bit simply because of my uh, workload increasing with my doctorate and then obviously with emergence continuing to grow. But I work with American football players as well. I spend most of my time in high school and collegiate, um, just for those that are unfamiliar with uh, my work and what I do. And like Sean, I want to gain an understanding of their form of life and what's kind of shaped who they are at this moment in time. And we know that that skill set is ever changing. It's not a, a static process by any means. So viewing it as an adaptation or skills that are adapting over time. And then how can I be helpful in that journey? That's a big thing for me. So something that I like to say often is helping them chase dexterity. And this is a, obviously a co-adaptive process. I mean, we, are we ever truly dexterous, but we can obviously help build abundance within the system. Uh, potentially help them utilize affordances more efficaciously, uh, maybe exploit particular opportunities for action that are arising um, on the landscape. And then also look at like, what might they be? And I use that word very strong there. Might they be rejecting? Because we this is just helping us glean a little bit more from the movement problem solving story. That's something that Sean mentions in the blog post there, because one thing that I want to acknowledge is from film analysis, like we can gain a lot of information but there's still a lot that's left out. So I don't want the listeners to think that whenever we're all discussing this here, that we've got it all figured out and now off we go, let's go destabilize that, uh, that current stable solution that is emerging. Rather, it's just informative to our learning design process. So for me, um, and this is a hard part, I really like to look at like what types of problems that are similar, whether it's 1v1, 1v2, 2v3 that are emerging, are they solving more often? And how are they going about solving it? And a lot of this is just short note. Um, I like to watch it at different speeds and from different angles. Um, and I really like to go from slow then back to real time. And the one reason why I mentioned that is it really gives me an opportunity to investigate the interactions that are occurring. Because if we're going to appreciate complex adaptive systems and the ability for these you know, independent components to organize in a number of different ways, then we have to appreciate the entire um, problem solving dynamics. And that includes other individuals on the pitch, on the court, rink, and et cetera. Um, and then knowing we're open systems, we obviously can influence the engagement of these interactions and they're never going to organize in the exact same way. So for me, I'm just trying to gain a better understanding of uh, what are the stable states of organization at that moment in time? Do I need to look at destabilizing that, that state of organization to potentially nudge them in being a more adept mover? And then could I design a number of other problems that just allow for them to search and scan and try to problem solve in different ways, even if they are performing at, in a highly effective way? I'll go ahead and stop there because I want to leave room from all, for all the other bright minds on the call. Yeah, no, I think there's an important point there, Tyler. And I think Sean has this in an article to, in his paper blog post, too, is the multiple angles looking at it because I think there's a danger here because when you look at film and you try to evaluate, obviously you're getting a totally different information, right? You're getting e exocentric information while the athlete's using egocentric. So you could see why didn't they do that? Well, it's because they don't see that. They don't have a bird's eye view of the field like you do. So I think that that's a really good point to try to use as much as we can from video to get at what the athlete is seeing. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, Casey, do you want to jump in and me how sure. you use? Yeah, yeah. So we have, so also, we have Craig join joining us here. Right, We're almost Craig. filling up the whole screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, actually, I think that what you just mentioned, uh, this egocentric perspective, uh, is is a pretty good segue. One of the things we've uh, 
know, tinkered with, messed around with a little bit recently is uh, the consideration of uh, the first person perspective of the athlete. And uh, whether it's via GoPro or um, there's these goggles that have on the bridge of the nose, they got a little camera. And uh, I think originally we thought, hey, this would be good for them to see. Uh, And what we found was it's actually probably most beneficial for what we see as coaches to get a sense for where their attention could be. Obviously, if it's not tracking the eye, it's not a complete picture of attention, but at least we get a sense for some, you know, proxy of the landscape that they're that they're able to glean in perceptual information from visually um, that helps us a lot as coaches and, and even more than than we expected originally when we started doing this we're going okay well we can show them this video and point things out and say hey think about that and think about this and pretty quickly we realized whoa their their you know optic flow is it field isn't anywhere close where to where it ought to be at least uh, to, to pick up information that would be more useful for them. And uh, that's been a big one. There's some hurdles there because the file sizes that come out of these goggles are I mean, <laughs> way too big and the technology is still catching up. But we found that that uh, has been uh, really, really beneficial for us as coaches to help inform, as Sean mentioned, activity design uh, so as to nudge them towards better information uh, that they could pick up in the environment. Because uh, especially the younger players, it's interesting you have more experienced players that are closer to expertise. I don't know if we have any experts, but that are closer to expertise. Their, 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 uh, their frame of reference, their visual frame of reference makes a little more sense, at least to us as experienced eyes in the sport. And then the newer kids, they're looking at stuff that, that you think, well, that, that probably doesn't matter too much. Uh, but that's been a big one for us. So uh, I think uh, we've kind of tried to go away from this uh, third person perspective um, and it's why everybody's a great quarterback on Madden and there's only like 15 good quarterbacks, uh, you know, on the planet because it's hard to do it in first person. Third person is a lot easier, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. I, and I guess, the, you know, the other angle, maybe I'll ask uh, Marisi, because I know you've done some work on like team level analysis, you know, do you, you like collect the behaviors and stuff? Do you... You, you, I guess position tracking equipment is better for that, but can, you know, can what can you use video for on that level? Well, um, yeah, let me let me you want to add. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Let, let me back up a little bit because I said, hey, uh, I'm the CEO now of a company called Cognia, but I never introduce what we do. And I think our goal, uh, first of all, is is to help people like Sean or Tyler or Casey uh, to to better. Uh, put the focus on, on the analysis and also we facilitate an automatic analysis on those uh, relevant aspects of the game. Um, and the whole, so the whole purpose of the Cognia, which is doing automatic, automated tactical analysis, comes from a very grounded theoretical uh, background in ecological psychology. Um, and we do it nowadays in soccer. I'll explain you now all the, well, at least the beginning of the journey I started from, from that theoretical background. Uh, but we do it nowadays in, in soccer. We hope we can do it uh, at some point in the near future with American football or uh, basketball or other sports. Actually, the CTO uh, of the company is Henry Harrison. Henry is a former student as well at CESPA. And also he was with Bill Warren in Brown University before his PhD. So um, so we would love to go to the NFL one day. But uh, let's start with soccer. So what, what I did in order to uh, come up with a solution, good solution for practitioners, for coaches in, in, in European football, uh, it was first of all to try to understand how we can uh, put in the video, how we can capture in the video the most relevant stuff, whether it's at the collective level or individual level. And the first thing I did, it was to understand the systemic nature of the game. So first of all, I uh, tried to understood what was the ontology of the game and the epistemology of the game. And here we need to assume that we, we, we need to assume that all the um, components, all the players on the, on the field are well-intentioned systems, and especially in high performance, Right, uh, in team sports, we, we assume that all players will have the the, 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 the goals very clear. Nobody's going to score goals in their own goal on purpose and and all this. Right. So based on that, based on based on that, um, we 
we kind of have a guidance for what are the most natural, almost lawful behaviors and affordances that can emerge as the play unfolds or, or evolves, right? And based on that, um, you kind of start ping, picking up certain behaviors uh, that somehow you can put in a hierarchy of um, episodes, scenarios that occur, and within those scenarios, you can even include some tactical patterns at the individual level, but at the end, uh, affect mutually at the collective level. And somehow you, you start having a classification of behaviors uh, that, um, in a way, facilitate the search for those affordances that Ty Taylor was mentioning or Sean uh, was mentioning, uh, that probably are most likely to happen uh, in one of the, in one of the players that you're analyzing uh, and you're gonna start picking out those like bad uh, habits that the player has and you can start correcting those things to orient that behavior towards the ultimate goal or to the real intentional uh, intentional um, uh, uh, goal that, that that player should be oriented towards to so in a sense, what what uh, uh, with it at Cogne, it's basically to have a library of tactics of uh, particular behaviors that we know that always occur. And what we do is highlight those behaviors um, just by putting overlay in an automatic way. So we detect the tactical pattern. We put an overlay on the video such that we can put the focus on that on those specific uh, tactics. Um, and therefore, the video analyst or whoever is the, the final user uh, can pay attention on those specific uh, tactics. But all this needs to be grounded, obviously, on a, on a theoretical framework, uh, so to say it, or in a playing style uh, that uh, the video analyst needs to, to use uh, as, a, as a reference for guiding the, the, the analysis. So I wanted to throw the question uh, there. Uh, those who look for affordances and try to get the uh, insights from the video analysis and then bring this back to the training field, um, do you follow uh, any type of guidance in, term, in terms of tactical patterns? Uh, do you already have a, 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 like a, a list of uh, um, things that, that, that you expect from your players or you are more open-ended and let's see what happens? And, and I mean, it's, it's either way, it's fine. Eh? I'm just asking because I'm interested to see how in different sports that work and... and, and yeah, I don't. This, this, someone else can jump in as well. But this reminds me of think the, the word I was thinking about listening to some of yours is stuff James has been thinking about. I think analyzing in terms of skilled intentionality, nested affordances, right? Um, thinking about tactics, kind of not as a prescribed play, but it, are the team keeping multiple affordances available, or as an individual player? I, James, do you want to jump in here? I know you've been writing about that, and thinking, is that kind of does that connect with what? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I would. I mean, Maurice uses the word tactics, and and I I would probably say like what's being highlighted are some of the key dynamics in the game. So it's the the relationships between the players. Um, and therefore the, the gaps and spaces that are emerging uh, as the play evolves. Um, and um, yeah, what I find really interesting in, in this discussion more broadly is, uh, and this is the, a team sports perspective um, that I'm bringing here, but um, like we often talk about wanting to educate attention uh, and for me, like the way video analysis traditionally has worked and the way people use video in team sports, I, I think is really quite poor for educating attention and educating attention towards key dynamics in the game. Uh, and Marisi can speak much more to this uh, and maybe actually I ask you to do that, Marisi, when I'm finished to talk about the issue with um, event data and event statistics. Um, but, but I feel that the video analysis that is predominant in football does not help educate coaches' attention to the key dynamics in the game. So therefore the affordances that are opening up 
Uh, and in the same way, it then doesn't really help the players either. Uh, and if uh, and help their education in the game as well. And so what I've tried to write about pre well recently is like, can we develop players' skilled intentions in the game? And for me, intentionality is this directedness towards the environment. So it is, it is helping to direct athletes towards key information in the environment. Uh, and much of video analysis for me ends up decoupling athletes from the environment by introducing overly abstract concepts um, that you have to show on a whiteboard first and then like explain on a football pitch. Uh, and a classic example in, in, in European football is um, any, any ta- lots of tactical concepts, but if you take the idea of switching the play, so if switching, like I was watching football with my mum and my sister and I, I did this little experiment with them and they both watch football their, their whole lives, um, but they're not coaches. Um, but they've watched me play uh, and we're watching the game. And I said, okay, if I stop this game right here and I was to say to you guys, we need to switch the play, well, what do you think that means? Uh, and they kind of looked at each other and they looked at me and they went, I don't know. I'm not sure what that means. And then I I said, okay, but if I was to say we need to play around the opposition, what would we have to do? And they were like, oh, well, that's easy. We just play it around the sides here. So for me, the the language and the concept there is decoupling people from the actual environmental properties and therefore not helping them attune to key information in the game. Um, and I think that is uh, that is an issue. Uh, and I think uh, coupled to that issue is uh, is the event, the reliance on events, and the reliance on statistics, and actually the tendency to break the game down. Um, whereas Maurice's work actually highlights the relations and the synthesis between players' movements. Um, which, which I think is really important. So uh, that, that's a little bit from me, but I, I'd kind of like to hand over to Marisi actually to to maybe talk about the, the issues with the uh, event data and the, that kind of st- statistical emphasis. Yeah. Do you want to jump sure, in there? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, yeah, I mean, look, nowadays the, the problem with video analysis is, uh, in soccer, at least, uh, I guess in other sports, must be kind of the same. But the problem is that the the general level in which most of the video analysis puts focus on is on the tendency of the playing style, right? So it's at this layer in which uh, we all look at tendencies of how many times we have attacked from this side or how many times we have uh, attempted to keep the ball uh, on the target. Uh, and obviously this has a, an easy way to, to compute uh, the tendencies with these expected goals. Uh, it's the, the most uh, fancy analysis nowadays that runs uh, yeah, within the sports analytics uh, domain and, and they are all excited about this and, and, and willing to explain the, 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 the behavior of the team based on that particular value, right? Like if it was uh, uh, another parameter that can explain the whole uh, team's behavior. Um, But there is uh, actually a deeper level uh, of analysis that uh, we are missing in football, and that's the the gap that Cognia aims to to, to solve, um, which is this, uh, what what James uh, uh, very appropriately correct me, uh, tactics or, or coordination dynamics that emerge uh, with the teams, right? So this type of aspect with the appropriate type of data is the one that nowadays it's not being uh, addressed uh, uh, appropriately. And the way to to address it, as uh, James said, uh, it's basically to put the focus on those aspects, those opportunities for action, those affordances that are um, obvious to the eyes of a coach, but that maybe are not obvious for the players. And this is why before I said, right, uh, if you guys uh, have in your uh, respective sports like this type of affordance is identified, right? I mean, the the, 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 the game, it's 
there are so many instances that that they are all different, but the general pattern, the gross movement, it's it's kind of the same. The final intention, the ultimate goal, it's that one, and and there is that space. That space can be bigger, or smaller, but we need to go through that space, right? So that's why I said if you if you guys have identified this type of affordances, because this is what we need to. To, to, to put the focus on and try to guide our efforts, whether it's at the coaching level or at the analysis level towards that specific level. Later on, yes, indeed, we can do and compute statistics or more you know, uh, computing-oriented approaches, but the most important thing is to get at this deeper level uh, and try to get this type of analysis. Obviously, in terms of quantifying this, I can talk later. Uh, I don't want to take too much room on, on my words, but 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 we'll we'll speak later about the, how to compute uh, certain aspects of coordination dynamics. Yeah, no, that that's really interesting. I th- I um I definitely agree. There's a lot of overlap. I think in in cross sports and use of space and breaking down space. And I think there's affordances and things. Marianne, I thought I would give you a a chance to what's resonating with you. Uh, get get your two cents. Um, yeah, really interesting, and, and especially listening to that, it's clear that most of you come from uh, team sports and invasion sports, which are very different from mine. So I'm kind of listening and thinking, how does this, how does this relate to the type of sports that I work with? Um, things that resonate, I think, um, definitely using video to move away from things like, um, you know, is this the short sections, and does this look like the correct technique? Can we draw lines on this video? Are you making the right shape type of thing, which I think used to get used for a lot. How can we correct this more to a bigger picture with some first-person stuff, usually GoPro? I haven't had a chance yet to play around with your eye-tracking cameras, although I'm hoping to shortly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think the really big thing for me is um, – using it as a way to in collaboration with the athletes so it's not just as looking at it from a coach's perspective but getting the athletes to have a look well first of all to ask what they would like to be videoed what would they like to see where do they think their attention should be what do they think they're missing um and then helping the athletes actually do um i think we, it, my research is called the self-confrontational interview which sounds awful but basically <laughs> that they're having a conversation and having an opportunity to to sort of narrate what what it is that they are aware of remembering i know it's not in real time anymore and we can't do it in real time because of those kind of sports um i'm also just picking up a little bit of what Maurice said as well i was just sort of smiling rally when you said things are obvious to the eyes of the coach and i work primarily in coach development and you would be amazed that coaches just don't see the same things so again video is incredibly helpful to help coaches develop even if you've just got a group of coaches going this is what I'm noticing and you're like no way (laughs) that's not what I'm seeing at all and that's incredibly helpful in terms of educating intention and you know an attention of your coaches as well as your athletes so I think I what I would add in you know a lot of that's resonating is just a bit more of it being much more collaborative and co-created that it gets really fascinating when we start getting those different perspectives and we can because we don't you know as a coach we don't know what that in the moment action capability that the athletes are going to the affordance they're going to pick up you know and even if I think about my horses you know one minute they're going to be fine the next minute they might have twanged something I, I, I was watching something recently and a horse ducked out and I was nearly throwing things at the tv because the the commentator was saying, oh, that horse just needs to learn to, to, to do as it's told, you know, that she's lost X number of points. And I'm like, well, the other option might have been a rotational fall and they're both dead. You know, you just don't know why it made that decision. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a lot in there about, you know, really moving the video analysis a bit bigger. You know, I think it was being really constrained before to so make sure we've got a bigger picture, more focused about what we're trying to understand. And just to help get a better understanding of where we are now. Like, I think it's Tyler, you said that, didn't you? It's to, to really understand where someone is now before we start, you know, um, before we start doing something as a coach, can we capture what's going on and understand it before we start changing things? So yeah. There's two pence worth for now. <laughs> no, that's great. Right. Um, maybe Sean, Tyler, or Casey, from from your uh, any thoughts about what uh, Maurice mentioned? From are we looking at the wrong things, kind of in, in in team sports, from your perspective as well? 
I think some are, um, and then some are not. Yeah, I know obviously. you. <laughs> some some, some are room. utilizing a, a, <laughs> a framework that obviously does allow the problem and the solution to be connected together, mostly through the affordances, the affordances as behavioral opportunities, sort of, so we can begin to look at the environment and respect the problems that exist within that environment for the respective player to sort of describe and measure the environment as a place for problem solving, right? So I think it really allows us to keep this mutual reciprocal relationship, not only between the player and the environment, uh, but also all the events that are within that are taking place within that environment. And within those events, kind of looking at these like really micro local problems of significance that could re represent these nested affordances you know, the simultaneous and successive affordances that the player could potentially perceiving, selecting, and acting upon. Because then I think there it allows us to really kind of begin to capture, and notice I say begin, to begin to capture or create this perspective as to how the perceptions, the intentions, and the actions may be coupled really to the problem and how the problem is having this mutual reciprocal exchange, how they're both reciprocally changing. I think that's really where the importance lies, at least for me and my perspective, specifically recently, looking at this mutual interplay, this interwoven integrated nature of it to see that when uh, interpersonal distance or the speeds between the relative velocities or speeds between players or maybe bearing angles or postural uh, tendencies or position orientation, all of these types of things that may be inviting a player to behave a certain way and then determining as that player acts in an attuned and adaptable way, how does the disposition or complexion of the problem actually change in a simultaneous or concurrent fashion? And then we see this interplay in this dance, and that's where we really get to kind of inject ourselves to determining why that player may be solving a problem in the way that he or she is, and then what we might be able to do to help facilitate maybe more functional movement behaviors, you know, because I, I think we're still... Uh, maybe coaches are drawing their attention much to the points that everybody else has made towards tactics, when instead I think that we can utilize that video or film analysis to investigate the skill and determine skill and movement behavior as a problem-solving activity and the processes that are sort of being carried out by each respective performer on both sides of the ball or on both sides of the scenario and situation. And that's really, to me, what becomes uh, truly intriguing about the whole thing. And as to why, um, so we certainly have to be careful as to how much speculation we're, we're making there. Uh, but also, um, as we try to do that speculation, we're utilizing a framework that allows us to keep the performer and the, or the player and the environment and its problems really together in this problem or solution dynamics. Yeah, no, I, I think there's good points and I think it reflects, um, we see some of in James' points, I think, I know it makes, we're trying to categorize, cater, use a categorical analysis of a continuous <laughs> dynamic system, I think is, is limiting, I think, right? Uh, Casey or Tyler, do you have thoughts on kind of the football and volleyball perspective as well? Yeah, I'll go ahead and jump in here. I think there are a lot of really good points, and it's going to be hard to touch on all of them. Hopefully, <laughs> I can I can uh, help shed some light on it or potentially answer a question here or there. Um, I will say that I think there one of the good points was the fact that uh, Marishi, I think you mentioned this, like from a practice design standpoint or a problem setter or maybe learning designer standpoint as a practitioner, um, an emerging academic, I, I come from a theoretical background. So my my theoretical framework is an ecological dynamics rationale. Uh, obviously appreciating ecological psychology, dynamical systems, and complexity sciences. And so for those reasons, like looking at, you know, synergy formation, looking at couplings, uh, you know, between teammates, but then also as that relates and how that relates to the interactions that occur between the opposition, um, appreciating Carl Newell's early work, you know, and then Keith Davids and Hanford and others and how they're reconceptualizing um, how constraints on behavior actually have a play, uh, well, in a worldview, but specifically within sport and how constraints are going to help shape and um, kind of guide or nudge the emergence of that skill, uh, that technique expression in context. 
Um, so I think for me, I think that's one thing I, I wanted to acknowledge because that's a very good point that I, I'm hoping that practitioners particularly take away from this. This isn't just a, oh, that sounds cool. I'm going to use this. Like having it uh, anchored to, or at least loosely anchored to a theoretical rationale there. Um, another good point that Marianne made um, was the fact that this isn't just for co- uh, for coaches um, in like a skill acquisition standpoint. This is also for like position coaches, such as Casey in volleyball. This is for um, anybody that works with athletes and that is utilizing any form of video analysis to help guide the the search process of athletes. Um, James made a really good point surrounding intentions and potentially the the intentionality being open and responsive um, to a landscape of affordances that could potentially emerge. And I think for me, and I'm hoping this and this starts to answer your question, Marishi, here, f- for me particularly, I don't always have the luxury to work with an entire team which is frustrating um, and also very limiting because I want to appreciate shared affordances. And specifically, if I have an opportunity to work with a number of players from a particular team, which I do have that um, opportunity occasionally, I also am using video analysis to watch a player or a teammate's behavior, even if I'm working with said player and the, the design of the practice that day is maybe targeted towards that particular player. Because if we are looking to potentially uh, design in, and I use that term loosely, um, but design in the potential for the emergence of an affordance, which is obviously, in my my opinion, coupled between the individual and the environment, then that's how that, that affordance is emerging. Um, and then their potential to pick up or or not pick up that affordance. Uh, for me, I need to appreciate what their teammates doing. So if I have an opportunity to analyze the teammate, that's going to give me a lot more understanding as to why they may have bounced the ball to the outside in you know in American football and hit the boundary as a running back rather than hitting the hole like the play was designed. And for the listeners, I'm using air quotes. The play was designed as a as an inside zone. They were supposed to hit an A or a B gap you know, in the line there, but they didn't, they rejected that opportunity because they, you know, maybe perceived it for ill and, uh, or maybe didn't even pick it up. And then they bounced the ball to the outside. So I want to gain a better understanding as to why. So I'm not particularly looking at patterns per se, uh, because I feel as though if I'm looking at patterns of play, I may be trying to push a technical model as a coach onto a team. And I would rather be the designer of, of, or maybe even the co-designer and something that I speak about very frequently is co-designing a learning problem with the athletes where you're gaining their input from how could you take this problem and scale or, you know, in a increased way or decreased way, the complexity in order for you to, uh, to meet or in order for it to meet you where you are at this moment in time, because I do view skill as an ever-changing process. So that might come in the form of removing a player from the space that might be Uh, reducing the size of the space. So then starting to look at task manipulation. And my last comment being, um, as far as how we use the tool, and Marianne made a really good point here with like, this is just potentially what they're reflecting on, which I know is a sticky subject for um, ecological friendly folk, because how, how do f- reflections actually play into what actually occurred in real time? And there's a lot of times where the athletes will say, well, I saw this. And then you watch the film and they, they then were like, never mind, I think I did this. And so th- there, there's, you know, there's a miss there, right? So I think we need to be very careful with what we uh, hear from them, but also watch their actions because that's going to speak a lot louder. But as coaches, we may be able to say, show me how you could potentially beat two levels of defense in this particular problem. And so I'm not telling them to look at the defender behind the immediate defender, but I'm trying to help educate their information and their gaze to a wider range or a larger space, which potentially allows for them to pick up those nested affordances and solve problems in a more skillful way. Yeah. Well, that's, that's really interesting. Casey, I'm interested in the, the volleyball perspective because, you know, compared for what Marisi was talking about, especially compared to soccer, obviously it's much more, running plays and less open in a sense, you know? So what are your thoughts on some of the using video and in that sense? Oh man. Well, we, we, uh, we do it at a couple different levels. We certainly do it at an individual level and, uh, to, to kind of riff off that a little bit, I, I think the words Tyler and Marianne used this idea of co-design, uh, we've leaned into that pretty heavily when anytime we're doing any sort of, video analysis at an individual level. And uh, so we'll ask them, hey, um, sit down, 
uh, they have this little web portal that they can go into and and observe practice, observe match, whatever you feel like watching, and just start identifying some things that you find most limiting, uh, whether it be situations or uh, maybe certain you know parameters of the game, like a rotation or something like that. And uh, just identify some stuff that's giving you and not identify the reason necessarily it's giving you trouble. Um, and we can sit down and do that together, but identify some problems. And then once they they kind of go through that, we'll do it as well. We'll kind of compare notes and then um, to kind of uh, encourage exploration, uh, we'll, we'll curate a, a set of video clips of people who have uh, what we would consider uh, similar relevant organismic constraints, if that makes any sense. So they're of similar height and they're similar jump touch and length and maybe position and, and stuff like that. And we'll just say, hey, here's a group of people who are uh, kind of at your level or maybe close to your level and who, who've encountered the same problem. And uh, here's a variety of things that they've done to effectively solve this problem. And uh, does anything stand out to you that you want to maybe uh, to help shape their intention? Uh, is there anything you want to go try to do today? And, um, but, uh, I think at the team level, we, we do some, some analysis as well. I think we're way behind as a sport. I think the lack of possession, like the lack of the ability to hold on to the ball in our sport, um, makes it a little unique. It's a rebound game that has multiple contacts. Uh, and at no point can I grab the ball, stop and assess and then manipulate control timing. Essentially I'm beholden to the timing of the, the contact prior to mine. And um, so that that uh, causes some very unique dynamics to emerge uh, that I think we have to be really sensitive to both in as athletes, as the performers, but also as coaches and understanding that. Um, <clears throat> so we've done some. I think our sport is a little behind. I think we, we tend to it's easier to do the individual stuff. <laughs> so and, and I'm guilty of this as well, uh, certainly. But it's easier. You feel like you're making a little more progress when you do stuff at, an, at the, the level of the individual as opposed to the level of the team. But we're trying. Um, you find it a lot, uh, which is probably a whole other can of worms, but you see a lot of uh, analysis at the team level when you're doing, quote, unquote, game planning. You know, you have an opponent coming up, and here's here's kind of the, the plan that we want to put together. And I, I'd be interested to hear Tyler and or Sean um, and, and probably James too, but uh, I just always have felt like American football uh, is – you know, you, somebody's calling plays, prescribing plays uh, at a relatively, certainly at the college level, at a relatively rigid level uh, where, hey, we're going to run this play. You're going to run this route and we're going to throw this at this time. You're going to block like this. And um, ours certainly we don't have enough control of the timing to do that, but we certainly do set things up. And that's probably the one time when we're uh, trying to piece these these uh, aspects of this dynamic system, us, the opponent, the, the 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 sport itself together um, but I think we have a long ways to go in our sport I, I certainly am not an expert by any stretch as you can tell as I ramble here but um, <laughs> yeah that's kind of where we're at for us no oh, that's really some yeah some really interesting ideas Casey definitely uh, um, I, I agree with you the kind of picking up the team <laughs> your the dynamics changes you're right you can never never being able to kind of set the play up um it is really a difference um Marisi, maybe i'll go back to you that i, I want to follow up on the tease you gave us on, on kind of your alternative way of looking at video kind of uh, and, and doing kind of from an affordance perspective yeah so can you tell us about kind of the, how you're doing that so, so sorry. Uh, in terms of uh, the game in team yeah, sports, yeah, yeah. You mentioned you you kind of hinted out you could get in some of the specifics of how you uh, you quantify the you know the okay yeah the yeah, yeah. Well, yeah yeah yeah. Well, in terms of quantification of the of the several patterns or or emergency of dynamics that 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 appear in the game. I mean, if we go back to the literature to the literature uh, in terms of dynamical systems, there's been always a tendency to follow up on whatever it's been done in a more controlled environment. Like, for example, I remember first studies in in team sports were kind of uh, following the trend of the HKB model. If you all remember the the, the relative phase. Uh, and people back in early 2000s start looking at the centroids of teams. Mm -hmm. 
And based on the movement of the centroids, they were assessing whether the teams were in phase or in anti-phase. So can you imagine the, the, the centroids of both teams? So this, obviously, in volleyball case, it wouldn't happen because it's not an invasive <laughs> team sport. So, so it would be difficult to quantify, but that was applied in soccer. Uh, and that was the beginning of a tendency towards going um uh, and replicating the synchronization uh, models uh, to quantify the coordination dynamics of, of teams or even uh, relative phases between attacking defender diet and, and stuff like this, but always uh, at uh, following the same mathematical models, right? So it's relative phase, uh, subtracting the angle from one another and, and seeing how, how much the strength uh, there is in the coupling. Um, the problem with that are, are two, at least two, two problems. One at the methodological level and uh, another one at the at the uh, uh, quantification level. At the methodological level, the problem is that these studies always have been conducted in one dimensional uh, state. Uh, so the problem is that it was taken one angle at one particular dimension. Uh, whether it's the displacements on the x-axis, longitudinal axis or latitudinal axis. And then the problem of that is that having to convert all these metrics in terms of quantification, eh, having to take all the displacements at the longitudinal levels and having to convert these metrics uh, in terms of angles to compute the relative phase, uh, the most common method has been used, uh, it's the Hilbert transform. And this had the problem that with Hilbert transform, you you, you get you get a, a, a phase angle that, that it's not really a, a physical angle, okay? So it's not a, an angle relative to an environmental property. And obviously this has caused uh, several problems. So, from here, there's two or three different roads that we can go to in terms of quantification. Um, but the, the ones that we are um, applying the most, at least, to detect these patterns nowadays with, with Cognia, at least. And here, uh, I would love uh, having Henry, the CTO, because he's the real modeler and the expert. But um, we know several approaches, like the behavioral dynamics or steering dynamics from uh, William Warren. And then we know that the uh, affordance-based model uh, where you know, the affordances or the behaviors uh, can occur within a particular range of, of uh, parameter values, right? So it's not like there is only one particular path to reach uh, uh, the, the, the final goal, right? So as long as you keep within the boundaries, uh, you you are safe in the safe region. Uh, so the work of Brett Fajan and and uh, and others in that topic. So we are using this type of uh, uh, models, uh, models that capture this type of physical relationships, and from there we just define ultimate goals uh, in the game. Right. So here an interesting thing that uh, I think it would contribute to the to the discussion is that. Independently of the level of the analysis that we need to, um, to, 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 to do video analysis or, or compute uh, any type of, 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 of analysis at the mathematical uh, level, uh, I think that the most important thing is that there's always uh, uh, an intention of the game. Uh, and and uh, I always, I mean, um, my students in the university, uh, I still teach some lectures in the university. Uh, uh, first day of class, I always tell them, if we had to explain the game of soccer to um, any, mm, <laughs> any uh, uh, not person, but uh, uh, anyone who comes from Mars, let's say, that doesn't know anything about the game, what would be the driving uh, parameters that would help them to understand the, the, the systemic nature of the game. Uh, and building up from there, we need to structure the, 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 the game, right? Or the information that appears in the game. And, and that's the, 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 the location of the ball and the team that is in possession of the ball. And based on these two relevant aspects, we're going to start constructing right the particular situation. And based on that particular situation, there is always a ultimate goal. Whoever has the ball uh, in a particular area, even if the ball is not there, someone visualizing the video without the ball being there could tell what are the actual dynamics, even if it's in a static uh, picture, right? 
and that's what needs to 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 help or drive the somehow the the the, the analysis that that we can do at the collective level. So well, yeah, yes, I, I'll pass I, it on to Marianne or. Yeah, I just want to mention that I think that's a great example, the team level analysis of why we need ecological plus dynamics when we study sports, right? Just dynamical systems analysis of 10 centroids in relative phase, you lose the meaning. We need the affordances and the attention. That's what Brett did with affordance-based control. You can't have information-based control, which is dynamical systems, is not enough. You need the ecological side. I think that's a great, if you want to understand why it's ecological dynamics, that's a great uh, example to look at. Marianne, did you want to jump in? I, I, I wanted to ask what might be a daft question, actually, based on what Marisi um, was saying. Is, um, is, is there a reason why, or do you also use gyroscopes, for example, on the players as well as the video analysis so that you get a better or a different perspective of what those coordination dynamics are and and the coupling and whether they're moving in phase out phase. Um, it's what we would use on like all rider dyads and things yeah. to pick that up. When you say gyroscopes, you mean like the the device the uh, analysis. The GPS and yeah, so the motion yeah, analysis. Yeah. Well, we, 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 at least with the work we are doing now, uh, we don't use that. We are all computer, um, computer vision based. Uh, so we do everything through the video. Uh, of course, we would get and win value from having this type of data. But uh, this is more uh, the, the, the reason why we are only video based uh, companies because uh, uh, in terms of business, it's easy and, and more scalable. But of course, there would be value, and, and we could do um, uh, a myriad different uh, analyses uh, at the individual level that we are not capable of doing nowadays. And of course, it would bring value. So, yeah. So is it a matter of, so you're taking kind of, you're having the same kind of data that, that you could centroid, phase, distance. It, is it, it's a matter of kind of, I don't know if the right, structuring the right word, or putting on top of that or, or viewing that through the lens of affordances and, and, and tactics. Is that kind of the right way to think about it? Or um, so c instead of just looking at that kind of raw, on a raw level, you're right, describing how many passes for the left side, like you said, trying to start from a more theoretical viewpoint. Look, is that what, you, what you're kind of doing? Yeah, I think I think here the the for example the centroids approach and and even the perimeter of the team or stuff like that. It's uh, like uh, if in the body we were measuring the anatomic structure of muscles, or right. So rather than seeing the functional purpose of the team and why it's a structure that way in that particular moment, uh, we are just looking the distance between centroids. Well, distance between centroids means nothing <laughs> unless you uh, put some uh, uh, explanation on, on the actual dynamics, unless you put the semantics, right? And uh, here is why I said first that one thing is to understand the ontology, so how the components interact among each other and why in these particular areas they act that way and why in these particular zones of the field act in a different way. But then it's the emerging semantics that exist on based on the rules of the game, based on the purpose, there's different semantics. Even in volleyball, for example, it has a very rich environment or, or American football, even though they are more constrained than that in soccer. In volleyball, for example, when you aim to uh, score a point, uh, you need to throw the ball in the, in the uh, opposite field. There's so many ways in which the team can interact. You can fake an action, and then the next, uh, you know, teammate can go and do it, and and that already has some information that that misguides maybe the behavior of the other team, uh, and and in a sense, uh, the centroid of that team in volleyball would be very far away from the normal position of the centric but in that particular moment context, it made a lot of sense, right? So, mm -hmm. so. That's why I said that if 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 we can call or put a word for that particular dynamic 
uh, or dynamics that, that has some semantics embedded into the game that, that in volleyball probably that has a name or this type of action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what we are interested in and where we put the focus on our analysis nowadays at, at Cockney. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I could give a, a really simple example, maybe, Marisi, of like the, the kind of collect. Um, the classic uh, defensive line imbalance. So the last line of defense in football is, you know, the line that protects all the space in behind and in front of the goal. So some of the most important space in the game. Uh, and so um, what what Maurice has been able to do is have uh, an analysis that any time there's a defensive line imbalance um, that's picked up um, by the video analysis software uh, and then that is basically stored and categorized for coaches so they can come along and look at all the situations where there's been a defensive line imbalance. So that could just be when you've got, you know, you're back four and one player steps out uh, which basically provides this little this little space for other players to run into and obviously a space in behind that that the ball can get into. So the, the, the shared affordance then to run into that space and to pass in that space emerges when there's a defensive line imbalance. Uh, and so capturing all of those moments in a game then allows a uh, coach and players to see how they've interacted with that affordance, whether they've perceived that affordance, whether they've picked up on it uh, and exploited it at all. Uh, and what becomes really interesting with that for me personally is, is looking at that long term with longitudinal studies, um, looking at how players might interact with that over weeks and months um, to see if they start recognizing that affordance uh, and start recognizing uh, opportunities to exploit that affordance and to see how that develops with time as their capabilities develop over time as well. Uh, and another interesting space this takes us to is if we know that we want players to become attuned to these uh, def this defensive line imbalance when one defender steps out of the line, then can we design sessions that accurately uh, recreate those dynamics? So can we, can we design representative uh, environments in our training sessions? Uh, and I think what can be interesting there is using the same software, we can then look at our training session design to see if those, uh, those dynamics are, are occurring. Um, so maybe that puts a, a little bit of meat on the bones as, uh, for, for an example. Yeah, no, I think that's a great example, James, and how to aden identify the, you know, the key dynamics and the points where you can possibly add a constraint or, you know, tweak practice to push things, you know, you, you know, create, you destabilize, push people to a different state. I think, I think that's a great way to think about it for sure. Um, any other thoughts kind of on the general? I have a couple questions, a little bit different angle. Um, long one. Um, we, we've been mostly talking about uh, coaches, using video for coaches. Any thoughts on turning it around and using, what do you do with it with the athlete? What do you do with the video? Um, you know, once you've, do you, do, you know, to sit down and watch, let them watch themselves. Do you guide them through it? Any Tyler, I think. Yeah, I'll, you know, I'll, yeah. I'll jump in there because I, I do utilize video a decent amount during practice. Uh, now, it's not like every single time a play unfolds, it's come back. Let's look at what you did. Let's have a five minute discussion about it. But um, and and hopefully I can capture <laughs> the months worth of this occurring, even years worth is occurring in, in a short snippet here. But what I will usually do, and depends on the length of time that I've had an athlete, but let's say I've had the athlete for, for a while and we've been choosing to partner together and we're starting to see some non-functional solutions emerge, or maybe they're not, maybe they're a little bit more rigid in the, what I can see from the motor system degrees of freedom standpoint. And I, I say motor system degrees of freedom because I look at it from an entangled relationship of, percep of perceptions and tensions and the actions. But if I can see a rigidity with, with maybe how fluid that they're moving 
limiting how elusive that they are. Let's say they're a ball carrier. Um, I may let a few plays unfold. I'm watching from different angles as a coach. I'm filming from different angles. And then we may have a short break and I'll bring them back. And I may let them watch the video for a second. And then it might be, um, show me how, uh, show me how you can beat this defender to the outside or to the inside, but with different speeds. So I'm not telling them how they have to go about beating. They have to beat them to the inside. They have to beat them to the outside. But the reason why I might be offering that suggestion is they're getting two-handed tag off or tackled very frequently, which means that they're either not picking up affordances that I would like for them to start to search and scan for those affordances, or they are rejecting them due to the uh, you know the um, inability or inability to pass through that particular gap. So why I might ask that question, show me how you can beat them at different speeds. I'm just wanting them to change the relative velocity at which they're entering, which is obviously going to affect because we perceive to act, act, perceive. It's going to affect the relationship, the body orientation, the very angle of the defender, which may allow for them to pick up affordances they had not picked up prior. And so that might just be one way that I will offer uh, a little bit of guiding intention and attention in order for them to potentially calibrate because they've now become attuned to information. But I don't hang my hat on success for one particular play or even one particular practice, because what I want to see is the stickiness of that behavior of that emergent solution over time. Because if we view emergent decision-making as something that is, is truly that emergent, then I need to see that occur. And they want to see that occur over a longer time scale. Now, obviously, the question then comes in is like, well, you may only have two weeks with them. You know, how how explicit are you with the instruction then? And so that does change things. And I won't go down too deep of a rabbit hole there, but there might be times and we at Emergence view that this still lives under an ecological dynamics rationale. I'm not telling them how to coordinate their available degrees of freedom, but I might say, have you tried to ex- beat them to the outside here? Not you have to on this next play, but just like explicitly stating it. and then designing a play to where now I have either shifted a defender, their starting position anyway, or potentially added a defender or changed the space, changed the location on the pitch or on the field, as we call it, American football, to where they may now start to search in different ways. So I do use it in practice as well, uh, simply because I'm not wanting them to then go replicate a particular action. It's just more a way for me to help guide their search uh, because now they're seeing their behavior um, unfold on video. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Just quickly, yeah, I think it's super interesting, Tyler. And I think what becomes really interesting with a lot of this is when it gets down to working with the athletes and you're actually on the pitch, it's it's almost finding like that elegant simplicity at the other end of the, all the complexity. Um, because, I mean, in our methodology at the club, we talk about um, you know, can we play? Um, can we play through the opposition? Can we play around the opposition? Can we play over the opposition? Uh, and recognizing that those, what I would call those three skilled intentions, uh, are very much related to each other in the same way as you know, you, something like uh, like like yin and yang, if you like. Uh, you know, as we look to play around the opposition, then we open up spaces to play through. As we start to play through the opposition, then opportunities to play over emerge. So the the goal then becomes: Can players be able? Are they able to to what I would say, like um, balance or juggle these skilled intentions? Um, so they're able to hold these intentions and and then be aware of the affordances um, that emerge uh, as the opposition move, as their teammates move depending upon the situation that they find themselves uh, in the game. Um, and what I think what that kind of gets at as well is something that Sean, you mentioned before um, around skill and tactics. For me, I, I don't really differentiate between them. Um, and so using this the idea of these three skilled intentions it's like it can be the person in football the person on the ball so i'm the person on the ball uh, i'm uh, searching to play through round and over the opposition but at the same time marisi uh, is uh, further ahead of me on the pitch 
and he's looking for opportunities to receive the ball through, round and over the opposition. Uh, and so the, the two of us are in like, on the same team, um, but I have the ball and he doesn't have the ball, um, but we're looking to coordinate our movements in order to satisfy the, one of those intentions. And it might be that as I travel with the ball, looking to go through the opposition or looking even to play around the opposition, uh, Marisi provides that opportunity, but one of the opponents steps across and moves into the, the line of the pass. And as this happens, Marisi then sees, well, James can't play around to me anymore, but he could play through to me. So juggling those intentions, he starts to move inside uh, and the ball gets played through. And I think what's what's interesting here is in, in that scenario, I, you could be describing something like a, a rotation or an interchange on the pitch or, you know, something that the um, the tactical bloggers could call like an inverted fullback, which is a piece of like, tactical brilliance from Pep Guardiola. But, but really it's players skillfully juggling uh, these intentions and recognising the affordances that emerge when they have these intentions. Uh, and for me, what we're able to do here is provide players the opportunity to coordinate um, and teams to coordinate. So we can be in positions to go around the opposition and to go through and go over. So there's, there's enough there for teams to, to coordinate and work together. But there's also those intentions are broad enough that there's so many ways to fulfill those intentions um, that there's such a there's such a scope there, the space for individuals to adapt and to be creative within that framework. So uh, as I'm looking to play the ball wide or around to Marisi and a striker steps across, I might be halfway through that action and someone like uh, Andreas Iniesta famous football player at um, FC Barcelona, would regularly do this. He'd be halfway through passing the ball. Uh, but then as the opposition starts to step across, he's able to adapt that passing skill into a dribble and he drives through the opposition instead. Uh, so he's been able to stay open and aware or like maybe in a metastable region, if you like, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, for long enough to really take in like the information, this uh, yeah, perceive this uh, split second information from the opposition uh, and be able to move from the intention of playing around to the intention of playing through. So if I'm a coach working with the players, I can talk about playing through round and over and feel uh, secure, <laughs> I think, uh, that I'm giving them enough to coordinate uh, as a team uh, and at the same time I'm creating space or leaving space open for them to be creative uh, at the individual level as well. Yeah, no, I think those are great examples, James and Tyler, both. I like, I think video using it with an individual is a great example of how we can flip the coach from the instructor to the more designer guide, right? So the traditional, we say, we want you to attack more, both the ways to start. The traditional ways we say, by doing this, <laughs> but the way like Tyler described is a guide. Why don't you look over here? The solution might be here. We're not telling you exactly what it is. We're kind of pointing you, educating your attention. So I think that's great stuff. One other thing yeah. I will mention very quickly, if I if I do have access to work with a team, which I do occasionally, I, I don't usually, but I do occasionally, it might be something like, what have you noticed about the way in which your offensive lineman in front of you is moving? So I'm directing their attention to their teammate, which is obviously going to allow for them to move in different ways because they may have not been playing off of them very effectively. They may have been running into them. They may have been trying to cut back and it ended up being, you know, ended up in a disaster and they got tackled at the line. So it might be something as simple as, have you even picked this up? Have you even noticed this? So once again, much in the same way that James is describing, you're kind of allowing for them to, you're, you're allowing for them to assemble or softly assemble their own solution but you're just kind of nudging that intention and allowing for it to emerge uh, from 
their abilities, not from your abilities. And that's one thing that I had to remind myself of personally very early on that, you know, I, and I've used this example before, but I'll make it very quick. I was barking at one of my teammates watching him on TV because he didn't pick up the space to the inside. He caught the ball and ran out of bounds immediately. And so then whenever I um, chatted with him after the game, he said, Tyler, I heard thunderous footsteps coming down, you know, from on top of me. So he was, he was, he had obviously picked up that there was space there, but was rejecting that opportunity uh, because of, you know, his ability to then play for another down. And so in sports like American football, where there's a lot of contact, there are times where athletes may pick it up, but they need to solve the problem in a different way in order to have a longevity in the game. Yeah. Great, great point. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another let question. Me, Sorry, let me ahead. add, hold on. Before we jump to another question, I would like to uh, follow up on that because actually sure. uh, James and Taylor touched upon that, which is uh, I'm building up from, from what I was saying, eh? the, the, the way in, in which I'm studying uh, and analyzing the game, in this case, the game of soccer, but based on on the, 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 the questions of uh, where is the ball and who is in possession of it, which are the driving questions for structuring the whole semantics of the game. The most relevant thing is, is, is not only if the players have seen or identified particular uh, aspects of the game, is uh, why uh, they need to act in a particular way. So once you have identified that there is an open space there, why uh, should we go towards that position or not? So, or, or why should I not go there to facilitate another teammate to, to, to occupy that space? And understanding the why for for players, it's, it's very important, right? And I think the, that on the coaching level, and based on my experience on the on the on the field, uh, I think that this is the most important aspect for even kids or professional players. If they understand what's their functional role in that particular moment in time, that's crucial. It could be that I'm the guy in possession of the ball. It could be that I'm the defender, that I'm the goalkeeper of the opponent team, and maybe I'm in the wrong position because I need to maybe step uh, 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 closer to the midfield line uh, because of some tactical or or or, or, or reason. Uh, I mean, for, for the game, in the game of soccer, like any other sport, there is a general uh, purpose. That it's a it's a it's like the 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 the, the final goal or, or 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 what it's driving every single movement on the field uh, and and what the teams need to aim at the end based on the individual behaviors and that each player understands what they need to do and and and, and their functional roles. It's to going to more uh, kind of thermodynamical ways, uh, the, th the uh, thermodynamical terms, sorry, the teams need to maximize the rate in which they uh, produce entropy in the sense that they need to uh, be as much efficient as possible towards that ultimate goal. And that's why I was saying before that, yes, of course, you have 10,000 different possibilities, but you need to drive your, you know, your behaviors towards that one that it's more efficient. And maybe that one that it's more efficient, it's not the shortest path of action in that moment in time, at least in soccer. Okay, maybe American football is different. I, I don't know. But at least not in soccer, because of what I was saying. Maybe I'm not going or making that overcoming vertical pass because I want to generate that space and move the ball there because then all the opponent team will balance towards that space. And yes, that single player then will occupy that. So there's a lot of potential movements that players can do, but the most important thing is whether they understand why those movements need to be done in that particular moment. As long as they know that, if they give you the right answer, bingo. That's what, as coaches, we should be proud of <laughs> once we, we, we get to that level with, with the players. And what you say, I just posted in the comments, I just remembered the paper of yours I was reading. It's, it was the comment to Paul Glazier's Grand unifying theory, yeah. where you go into the is that a that a good place to start with the the semantics? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, Taylor, if you want to jump. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I was just waving bye to James. He was he was waving yeah. the head to head out. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> thanks, James. Just waving bye to James. Yeah. yeah. I actually yeah, have not I, read that paper yet. I will pick it up because I've read uh, the 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 uh, former, the one that you were commenting on from Paul. I have not read yours, so mm -hmm. I'll have to pick it up. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's a yeah. fairly short introduction to the that idea of the functional semantics. I think it's a yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. It's it's like specifying so the information, the surrounding environment, the properties, dynamic properties, static properties of the environment tell you a lot about what should be your function, what should be your actions, right, oriented towards a specific goal. And and obviously there is an immediate goal that maybe you need to satisfy in order to achieve or to get to that ultimate goal. And that's uh, uh, that's what the, the paper is about, and, and talking and addressing this. And actually, the the example we we're putting in the paper uh, with Turbi, it's about that, right? The the opportunity for a pass uh, in a in an imbalance of the defensive line in width, uh, and 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 the the several um, uh, several uh, components or players that need to be coordinated uh, for that action to happen, right? And, and the commensurability between the affordances and the uh, actions that need to be realized in, in that moment. And here is where we make the linkage, not only in terms of affordances and effectivities, but also in terms of information being brought uh, uh, at the level of uh, energy in order to quantify those actions that still have not happened, but to put it, to put the, the information at the same level of energy. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, more, more theoretically uh, oriented <laughs> that point. Yes, but, yeah. it's not the easiest read, but it's definitely uh, very, yeah, it's yeah. very interesting. Uh, um, it's, it's, it's a really, that's a good place to start with that idea. And I agree, I agree completely. The other kind of general question we got was, you know, um, getting the stuff you're doing in the video room with an athlete maybe to transfer. To onto the field. I think we've touched on this a little bit. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's about designing the practice is going to connect with what you've shown in any, any extra, any thoughts on, on that? Uh, Marianne, do you have a, how do you take what, you know, you use in video and, and, and use it in practice, make sure you get, you get transfer. Sorry to throw you on the spot there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good. I was just, um, I was thinking about that, uh, using the video to help athletes, because again, it's quite a different, a different um, environments that I'm in. Um, the environments that you guys are working in, uh, you can never replicate them again, can you? They're just, they're completely dynamic. And I mean, you might be able to do set pieces, but essentially it's always changing. And it's a complex adaptive system. Whereas if you're, you know, paddling on a wave or you're climbing a rock face, it's not responding to you. <laughs> it might feel like it sometimes, but it's kind of fairly, stat you know, that environment is not changing when you move or you change. So often the video analysis is really useful in helping the athletes to actually get a better understanding of where they are and in their interaction with that environment. The bits they can't perceive or they're probably feeling, but they're not seeing. And then the video helps them connect it. I mean, probably using water is a better example. So someone's like, oh, that, I didn't think that was the line I was on. No wonder I missed, you know, whatever the gate or, you know, the, um, but when they then, they kind of, they do it again and look at it and they're like, oh, that felt different. And it's actually helping that perception action coupling. It's helping them to recognize if it feels like this, then that's probably where I'm on or it helps them recognize where they're missing something. Usually timing as well, actually, which is interesting. In, in, I get it's an interesting question about then applying it to um, the environment because it's it is in is in it we you know we tend not to if you're bouldering then that is your environment it might be you know if you're going to go and compete you might be on a different boulder but but the, the transfer is can you know you still managing to to boulder it's 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 a little different like that um, I guess. Uh, where where things would be different um, is when you're trying to do some some work in a certain environment that you you want to go into a um, a higher risk environment or a or a, you know a, a more um, a bigger bigger water or something like that and that's that's an interesting concept because we can still only work with what you've got there you're not actually got a person you're only we call it hard skills on easier water you know you just try and get much much more accurate with what you're doing in that that particular environment before you try and move up to doing something easier in a in a bigger environment i'm yeah. not sure if that answers your question no no i think that's <laughs> i think that's a really good point about the you know you can never recreate the same yeah. thing you know that's a part well, of we, the whole we point. can in some yeah. of ours you can do the route again you know the route yeah. as you guys go <laughs> my yeah. son my son's been in australia too long he does that so you can you can kind of do it again and then compare and go, oh, that's interesting. You know, I was on a different yeah. line then. Or, 
um, I, that, that's why it felt strange or, you know, like it felt, my, you know, the, it felt smoother or whatever. And they can have a look and go, ah, I was on that bit of the feature. It, it, I think if it's used well, which is why I was saying at the beginning, I think it needs to be very much, you know, for me, a collaboration with, with, with the athletes um, to help them get better at connecting to their environment, to help mm. that environment individual um, mm. interaction. And for them to recognize maybe where there were things happening that they weren't aware of and then they can broaden. They're either feeling for it, they're looking maybe for that through, whether that's just through feeling the water or through the paddle or actually visual, they can look for that information that they recognize they missed the time before, but they have the opportunity to do it again quite often. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. no, I so think it's very that, different. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think that's a great way to think about it. Think about the information and then in practice how can i augment that constrain you know i think that that's a, a great way to connect the two um i have to wrap up in a few minutes guys i didn't know if anyone doesn't i, well, I thought since we've had everyone else on before i thought marisi i would give you a chance to t uh tell us a bit more about where we can learn more about what you guys are doing your company and and if people are interested it sounds very uh, fascinating <laughs> i'm interested i i'm not involved in soccer well a little bit but I'm, I'm really interested in here where we can learn more about what you guys are doing well yeah. well first of all i i appreciate the opportunity that uh you james gave me uh, tonight mm -hmm. uh, and i think uh, i've enjoyed a lot the uh discussion with all of you and and uh, hopefully i'll, I'll be uh uh, keeping an eye open to uh, or the the ears <laughs> open to to listen to you more uh, often and hopefully we can uh, meet again in another discussion um, about Cognia. Cognia is a is a startup company based in Barcelona. Uh, it's been uh, now the second year that we've been uh, putting the the well, developing the product and we just started the, the commercial launch. Uh, phase back in June. Uh, we have started working with uh, uh, three clubs uh, and now closing a few other uh, new clubs, professional clubs. Uh, and, and again, what we are doing is basically capturing video from the uh, games. Uh, we are generating our own uh, raw data in terms of tracking and eventing. And we use those uh, data files to generate uh, primary variables like from the position uh, we get speed, acceleration, and all this to construct higher order variables that end up uh, to uh, the type of affordances or tactical behaviors or patterns that we were talking about, like defensive line imbalance, receiving a ball in between lines, concept football concepts or soccer concepts that that are um, that are concepts that that coaches uh, somehow. Uh, would like to to look for while analyzing the video. We do not only detect those patterns in the game, we also uh, put an overlay on the video. So each tactical fundamental has an overlay uh, related to it. And these uh, overlays are exhibited and displayed in, in the video. And you can learn from, from, from the company uh, in the website, cognasports.com. Uh, um, or you can follow us in, in um, Instagram and, and LinkedIn uh, and all this. But look, uh, I'll be happy to join in more discussions about ecological psychology. It doesn't need to be on uh, game analysis. I'm, I'm <laughs> a, a big fan of, of ecological psychology. I'm, I'm, it's my passion. And, and of course, uh, I'll be happy to, to be back uh, and discuss For sure, with you. Yeah. So. Feel free to reach out as well if you for sure, yeah. If you want to yeah. keep discussing on certain things, <laughs> I know you've done a lot of different things, and I'm sure the emergence guys are just jotting your name down <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. as a potential guest too. Um, yeah, so yeah, definitely, and I, I really enjoyed this discussion. Well, a couple, you know, overall things to stand off on me. Obviously, we still have a lot to explore on the potential of using film and video. I think we're just scratching the surface. And like with everything in this, the role of the coach is not going away. It's as important as ever. Like the semantics stuff, functional is not can't replace that with date, just raw data. You still need someone that understands the skill and everything in between it. So I think that's another message that came through with me. I'm here. So thank you everyone for joining us. I think that was really fun. Went by fast as usual, but uh, I think we'll sign off for now. Until next time. Cheers for now. 
Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakeyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including written transcripts and a monthly group meeting, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perception action. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled.